Next, from Chicago, we sit down with John Cooney, the president of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association. We talk to Mr. Cooney about the realities of working as a trial lawyer and some of the common misconceptions about the profession, as well as legal and ethical issues related to electing judges as opposed to appointing judges. This runs about 40 minutes. John Cooney, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. You bet, Terry. As the uh, 2015 president of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association, we wanted to visit with you and uh, both delve into some of the issues that are of concern to the Trial so Bar Association and, and also just uh, maybe have you explain some of the workings of what a trial lawyer does. Uh, we are so often hearing in your profession maligned and uh, as you well know and everyone else does, I mean jokes and these are the guys that chase ambulances and sue everybody. Um, there is often, in so many things in life, a, a gap between what we think we know and what the reality is, so we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about some of this. Sure. As we know now, we have uh, the first Republican governor in 12 years, uh, and in his State of the State address, delivered just about a month ago or so, uh, the, the governor said he wanted to change the way Springfield works. Part of that was to um, have tort reform, which he has not laid out exactly what he wants to do on that. He also mentioned uh, changing ethics, and he thought there were some conflicts of interest, and he raised the issue of uh, various groups, uh, unions, and all, uh, giving money to people who negotiate their salaries. Uh, I think he might have also said something about the trial bar uh, or lawyers donating to the elections for judges and all. Let's start with, if we might, um, just tort reform. Relative to the allegation we often hear that basically along the lines of people get sued for no reason and uh, some trial, some tort lawyer will bring them on some case to uh, threaten to bring them to court just so that they can get a, a quick settlement and in essence milk an innocent victim is the way it's, it's presented. What, what is your view of that? Well, I, I think there's always a big difference between reality and spin or myth. Uh, but I, I often ask people, because I agree with your original statement, uh, trial lawyers can be the butt of jokes, and in fact all lawyers, I guess all professionals are the butt of some kind of joke, and they're big boys and I think they can take a little humor and they should take that. Um, but in terms of sort of the, the, the idea that people want to bring a case that has no merit, that a lawyer wants to do that. Uh, just think of that logically. Think of the common sense of that. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm paid on a percentage of a recovery. So why would I want to bring a case that has no merit, that's going to lose, that's frivolous, so I will get a third of zero just think of that as a business idea. First of all, why would I want to waste my time, effort, the court's time, the world's time, and bring cases that have no merit? That really isn't what the insurance industry and big business is concerned about. Can I insert for a moment sure. just to explain the, the business model? Someone might bring a case to your attention, mm -hmm. say we want to seek uh, legal representation. If you think the case has merit once you hear uh, what the facts are in the case, Typically, if I'm right, you would take it on without the client having to come up with X number of dollars per hour. Uh, on the other hand, if you win the case and there's a settlement, then your firm would typically get a third. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's standard around the United States of America. The, the reality is, is that most of the people I represent are working people who logically are people who tend to get hurt more than you and I, a broadcaster or a lawyer, would be less likely to get hurt in our workplace environment. But the people I represent, a pipe fitter, a, a, a laborer, someone who's working in construction, they don't have the ability to go out and hire some lawyer and go to their own pocket and begin paying hundreds of dollars an hour for that effort. So a contingency fee arrangement is one in which I have to review that case up front and make certain that it has merit because I'm going to invest years of my time and many dollars in that case. So the last thing I would want to do is find a case that has no merit that's going to waste my time, my, my lawyer's time, my money, and, and lose the case and not be paid. 
That's a very quick way to go broke. So the, the logic of bringing lawsuits that have no merit has always to me seemed to be on its, it stands logic on its head. Uh, why would anyone do that? Uh, every, every field has bad apples. Uh, doctors, teachers, police officers, journalists. Uh, journalists never. <laughs> Especially with the Illinois Channel. Absolutely. But uh, what, what, how does the trial bar uh, police itself to the extent that it does? Well, we have what's called the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission. Every lawyer in the state of Illinois obviously needs to finish law school, pass the ethics portions of the bar exam, but most importantly, continue to be monitored by the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission, which enforces the, the, the rules of ethics, the canons of ethics, and the laws about how a lawyer must conduct himself. Um, and it's very important to me, it's very important to every lawyer that, I mean, your critics in the insurance industry may simply want to denigrate what you do because they have a financial interest. But my clients typically are folks that have, uh, that are families of people who have been killed, people that have been paralyzed, people that have been burnt beyond recognition. They need to know they have someone they can trust who's honest, who's on their side. Um, that's essential. And what the ARDC, this group, does is enforce that. And that people who are not following the rules are simply suspended or revoked their licenses. And it happens all the time. I wish that were true in other professions. There are professions that are regulated by professional organizations, but how much teeth they have, I'm not so sure. I know with lawyers, it is very strict and very strictly enforced. Would it be true that if there was a uh, lawyer who if you remember the movie The Fortune Cookie actually came out around 1965 with Jack, I think it was the first one with Jack, Jack Lemmon and uh, Walter Matthau, where uh, Walter Matthau was basically a, uh, I don't know, a shyster lawyer. Oh, for the he was, he was yeah. like a small time guy in an office with files everywhere. Right, and, right, and, and was just trying to uh, pull a fast one. Uh, if there was that type of an individual working, <laughs> would, would the judges know of him? Would he, by reputation, uh, not be taken seriously? I mean, to, sure, you know, right. there's rules and then there's realities within the world to where sometimes a profession, as you said, not even officially, but sometimes just unofficially because you're uh, cast aside within your profession. Would that be the case, you think? You know, the, the media and, and movies have great and funny uh, um, portrayals of lawyers. Everybody from Walter Matthau in The Fortune Cookie, who was sort of a sad sack, to lawyers like um, um, in To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Gregory Peck, probably my ideal of what a lawyer ought to be about, somebody who stands for things, somebody who has principles. Uh, I got to tell you, my, I, my father was a lawyer, uh, and his father worked on the railroad. And my dad used to say, you know, I wake up every morning, I am proud to be a lawyer. I can't believe a, a kid like me from the west side of Chicago is a lawyer. That's a big deal, uh, and it's a big deal to me, and it should be to anybody who is a lawyer. You've got a lot of people's lives, count. they're, they're, they're really counting on you. And it, it's, it's, while it's pressure, it's also, uh, it's an honor to, to, to do it, and hopefully we do it right. There's an argument uh, that, I think a lot of arguments have some merit. Uh, it's just a question of to what extent. Mm -hmm. We pick up any number of products, and they have seemingly ridiculous warning labels on them. I mean, we don't have to make any up. Everyone's seen them. Uh, and, and people will say, this is because so many industries have been sued that the, the lawyers for ladder makers or whatever it is say, put on a label mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't misuse the product. If someone puts out a legitimate product, like a lawnmower, a push lawnmower, and someone is, I think this was an actual case, uh, dumb enough to pick it up and hold it to trim the top of their bushes and ends up cutting their hand off. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to sue the manufacturer in a case like, I mean, you know, in that case, well, not just that case, but mm -hmm. in a case where someone totally abuses the use of a product, how would you, as a lawyer or others that you know, if someone brings a case to you like that, how would you consider something like that? And I guess the, the larger point of this question is, what's the criteria you use when you hear a case to filter out if 
well, that's a legitimate victim here that needs compensation, or uh, you were just an idiot for using the ladder or your lawnmower like that. In fact, uh, I've got a direct and simple answer to that question. If someone came to me and said they picked up their lawnmower and tried to mow their hedges with it, I would thank them for their interest and I wouldn't take that case. And nobody would take that case. I don't know if that case is an urban myth or if it really happened, but think about that. I want to spend two, three years of my life representing someone who picked up a lawnmower and managed to just put his hand into the whirling blades. Uh, my guess is there's more to that story than, than what we hear. All these myth stories are typically a distortion of the facts. And the facts matter. Because think about what your original premise was, was that when you know, there's too many warnings on things. <clears throat> I've got to tell you, even in the 35 years I've been a lawyer, the world is a much safer place. Look at your car that now has lap belts and uh, puncture-proof um, gas tanks and airbags. I can tell you that the number of cases and the injuries that happen in high-speed collisions are so much less than when I was a young lawyer. You used to get in a car, if you got in a car wreck at 30 miles an hour, you'd be lucky to walk out of the car without being ripped apart. The fronts of the cars were made out of steel. There were no airbags. When I was a young lawyer, I must have had dozens of cases where people's arms and fingers were cut off in machines at work. We don't see those cases anymore. They now have guards on those machines. The, the, the lawyers are putting themselves out of business, and that's a good thing. The world is safer. We don't see those kinds of injuries. We see different problems now. You, you know, Bad I would, drugs and things. Uh, not to interrupt, I was going to say, and not to necessarily make your case for you, but on the other hand, let's just take some, an ongoing case, I would say. I, I can't remember the actual name of the, it's a Japanese firm that w makes uh, what the ignition switches, I think, for the one of the car makers. I don't want to say for it. GM. Uh, where they were essentially making a decision that they're, even though it would have cost a relatively minor amount per vehicle because they're producing millions of vehicles, they decided not to fix the switch and it resulted in, I, I think we still have a growing list of uh, hundreds of deaths of people who have been injured or, or killed by that. Uh, I guess that's the other side of the coin. If, if, if you have someone in whatever industry that says, yes, it would only cost five dollars to fix this, but if we're going to put out 30 million units, we don't want to spend 150 million dollars to fix it, uh, we'll just... You've, you've hit the crux of product liability law. If, if the people who make the decisions about whether to save that five bucks across 30 million units are people who are bean counters and accountants, they'll always make the wrong decision. But if it's someone in risk management who says, yeah, we saved five dollars on the car and that was good, except we killed 30 people and we're going to have to respond in damages to that. Even from a business standpoint, forget the human side of it. That's stupid. But the, the families of the 30 people who they decided to just take a risk with, they're going to be able to come to court and face off with Toyota or General Motors in an e even playing field and say, you know what? That decision that you made for my husband, who I loved very much, and he died when he was 32, that was the wrong one, and I'm here to hold you responsible. What about the argument on, uh, and I think you could say this, and manufacturers would probably make this argument as well, but let's take medicine. We often hear that doctors, hospitals are performing defensive medicine and ordering any number of tests which drive up health care costs because they don't want to be accused after the fact that they should have done this test uh, in some lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Let's think of the logic of that. I hear that from doctors and hospitals who, after all, are in the business of a, being a professional, uh, but they're also in the business of making money. Well, on the one hand, ordering tests to make sure they amputate the right leg and not the wrong one, running tests to make sure they cur find the cancer instead of missing it, those are good things. Now, the, the idea that healthcare professionals prescribe too much um, tests for their patients and therefore make too much money themselves and they want to blame the lawyers. Oh, the lawyers made me do it. They made me make all this money. That's a lot of nonsense. And they know that and any right-thinking person knows that. The critical difference is, is that we should have the right number of tests. We should have the correct prescription of medicines. We shouldn't just say, let's just order every test under God's green earth because of course that's not necessary. But let's not sit there and, and kid ourselves and say, do we, do, is there a financial motivation for people to deliver medicine perhaps more than they should? 
That's not going to create a problem for them in court. All that's going to do is make them money. That's a silly argument. You know, everyone makes mistakes. We know that going in. I've, e I've even made a few mistakes. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. Do we run the risk, as this is a, a critics would, would say, that the way the tort system works today, we're asking people to have an error-free society, and if you're not error-free, which no one obviously is going to be, mm -hmm. you're going to be sued for making a legitimate error, where it wasn't malicious in its intent. Uh, no, of course you, it, you can't say if it was right. a minor or a major mistake unless you had a specific, but are we, are we forcing people to operate in an error-free environment lest they have a legal gun to their head? Mm -hmm. Uh, of course not. And these cases get tried in the real world with real people on the jury. And if I come in and I've got some case where I'm nitpicking and the guy didn't really do anything wrong, they're going to flush me out of court in a minute. That happens all the time in courts around America. It doesn't even get to that point. Uh, of course you can't be air free. But what you can't be is negligent to the detriment of somebody's life. Uh, it, it, if the consequences are such that your negligence paralyzes someone, of course you're going to be responsible. Now, you, you use the word, they didn't mean to do it. Well, if they meant to do it, if somebody meant to paralyze someone, they should respond in criminal court. Uh, people say that all the time. Well, I, it was an accident. I didn't mean to run them over. I just, I, broke, I ran through the red light. Or I, if you meant to run them over with the car, you should be in prison. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with someone was negligent. They were careless. They were not exercising due care and as a result someone's dead or paralyzed. But that doesn't mean that they're bad people. It simply means that they were negligent. And that's why they bought their insurance and that's why, why that should be resolved appropriately by fair people deciding that. But I agree with you. There is no need for uh, us to expect perfection in the world. It just, there just isn't. We're people. I mean, uh, not to have you be on the defensive side of a question every time. Oh, let's I'm let's happy take to be it. Defensive. Let's take an offensive note. Right, yeah. Let's take it from the standpoint as you look back over your career in some of the cases. You don't have to name names if you don't want to. But uh, what would be an example or some of the cases that stand out in your mind where you think these are some of the cases that were the hallmark of my career, mm -hmm. where either you really felt you attained justice for someone, or perhaps there was a case where maybe you changed the whole way of operations within an industry that improves safety. You know, it might be that all of us, as you alluded to in the uh, example of the automobiles, and, and you're right, uh, any number of safety devices. I had a friend who was hit by a drunk driver about a year and a half ago. Uh, in years past, she, her face would have been smashed up. Maybe she would have been killed. The airbag saved her face. She had some injuries, but they were, relatively speaking, minor in a head-on head car crash because of the safety devices that were now put in there and which the automobile industry did oppose putting in there at the time that those were uh, being discussed. Fought us and the government tooth and nail to put airbags in. Think if we didn't have airbags. I got to tell you, the pictures that we used to see and the, the evidence that used to come into court of kids and women and men just ripped apart that we never see anymore. It's just a, a, a brave new world because it, if you get an automobile accident in 2015, on a highway, you've got a pretty good shot of walking out of that car. In the old days, you didn't. Uh, it just didn't happen. And, and, and car accidents happen. But the consequences of car accidents are so much better now. Uh, individual cases, you know, when lawyer, you tell lawyer to start bragging about himself, you, you, you'd, be, you'd have to run this tape for a long time. Uh, maybe not in my case, but in most lawyers' case, cases. But it, it, you're right. It, 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 there are cases that I've handled that we're very proud of, that I'm very proud of. We represent a lot of people who have this hard to pronounce disease called mesothelioma. And uh, it is, it's just a tragedy what happened there. <clears throat> 30 million Americans were exposed to asbestos. About a third of them veterans, Navy veterans. And for the people that get that disease, the average life expectancy is nine months. And I've represented a lot of these men and I gotta tell you. Does that come from fibers in the lung? Is that what it is? This is asbestos that they breathe in and it goes into your lungs and it's, it's a misnomer. It, the tumor doesn't actually happen inside your lung. It happens in the sac around your lung called the pleura, sometimes in, in, in your peritoneum. And you get this disease and it encapsulates your lung the way uh, the rind of a grapefruit would. And then it gets harder and it compresses your lung 
slowly and slowly, and the mechanism of death is suffocation. Now think about that. Think about facts where the companies that made this product knew it caused this disease and kept selling it anyway. How, do, how you do, know, I know how do you know that? How do I know that? Was there actually documentation that you found? Great, answer, great question. Forget what I would say. On papers that we found in their documents back when they were selling this, in their own language, in their own words, on their documents, which is why those cases, when they're tried, and jurors see that evidence, the most conservative juror in the world will tell you, that's wrong. Because before I was in doing what I do now, I was a, a prosecutor. I was a criminal prosecutor. And I handled murder cases that were less compelling than some of the documents for not all companies, but some of them that knew this. It's, it's just a tragic tragedy. And the guys, the men and women who get this disease are just everyday guys who went to work. They didn't, it's, these are not like personal choices. I chose to smoke or I chose to take a particular medicine. All I did was go to work and breathe. And then I get this call that I've got this unpronounceable disease and I've got a couple of months before I'm saying goodbye to my family. All avoidable. None of this needed to happen. And why it happened, it's just, it's one of America's most horrendous occupational health stories. Really, just horrible. Let's talk a, a bit about uh I grew up in Missouri. The judges there are appointed by the governor, kind of as they are at the federal level. Here in Illinois, we elect judges. I think the, uh, there's been debate over the years about whether we should have judges be elected or appointed, and, and people point to a number of cases, uh, whether when a judge running for the Supreme Court is running initially or in retention, just how the in recent years, the cost of these judicial races have gone through the roof comparatively. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in general on that? And then maybe I'll do a follow-up. You know, I see the pluses and minuses of both systems. When I hear about uh, maybe we should have judges appointed, my first question, like a lot of people in your audience would say, appoint the judges. Okay, who does the appointing? Well, well the governor well, would let's be. have would, the governor do it, or right. let's have the legislature do it, or let's have whoever we do it you're going to be electing that individual. Right. So I'm always a little nervous when, the, uh, when we separate uh, from the people who does the appointing. It's, it's like, well, I elected the governor, but now he's going to appoint the judge, but he doesn't have the confidence that I can elect the judge directly. So I'm a believer in democracy. Isn't but I also, see, I also see the other argument that says, well, are people educated and, and attuned and focused enough on e individual judicial races? that they know who they're voting for. Well, I mean, probably because I'm in this business, I know who I'm voting for, and I make it my business to know who I'm voting for. But that's true when I vote for my congressman or my ward, uh, uh, if I, my alderman. Uh, I think it's our responsibility as citizens to know what we're doing. You know, as a practical matter, though, and I mean, we, and I don't mean to cast aspersions on anyone on the Supreme Court, but let's just take as an example the Illinois Supreme Court where they're elected. People in the know who talk about different issues will talk about the argument going before the court, not on every case, but on certain cases that have political ramifications. And they'll note the, whether the, how many Republicans versus Democrats there are on the bench. Uh, I would think most people would think we shouldn't have politics involved in making a judicial decision. Shouldn't that just be on the merits of the law, irrespective of political party? And to what, and to what extent is the election of judges, is the raising of money to either try to get someone off the bench or on the bench, distorting the legal process, even if it's, as we so often say, the appearance of impropriety? Mm -hmm. Well, I think anybody who knows the Illinois Supreme Court knows that if you're trying to predict how a case is going to come out based upon the political party that that justice originally ran as a candidate on, you're, that's a fool's errand. You cannot predict what each individual justice thinks about a particular issue before the arguments are heard, before it goes forward. It, it's, it's, I mean, that's sort of uh, amateurish to think that a judge says, well, I was elected as a Democrat, and therefore, I will always vote with the Democrats. You can, people, people who know this court know that these are very bright, very independent people who call them like they see them. And uh, the, the political side of that 
is so much overstated. And, and people that think they can just say, well, I know that there's X number of Democrats and X number of Republicans, therefore I'll tell you what will happen, those guys go broke. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just as an example, uh, I presume if someone's running uh, for the bench, I mean, they're going to go out and just like any candidate for public office, they're going to have a fundraiser, right? Sure. So Republicans will raise money for their candidate, Democrats will raise money. If the trial bar is raising money, uh, and again, there's going to be, this is going to work both ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't mean to indict the trial bar as a group, but I mean if the trial bar raises money for Judge X and that person's elected to the bench and a case that you as an individual or maybe it's known that this is a case that's of interest to the Trial Lawyers Association in general, is it a conflict of interest then for that judge to rule on that case and I mean it's again this has worked both ways where sometimes you hear arguments that you know judge Y ought to recuse themselves from this case because maybe they had campaign funds come from someone who's appearing before the court. It, it, it very the, the public should know that that justices, judges, appellate court judges recuse themselves all the time from cases where they either know the, the individual litigants where they know the lawyers, where they have been politically supported by the lawyers. I can't tell you how many times that occurs. In fact, when I support someone, I, I'm looking for someone who's independent, who believes in access to courts, and someone who calls balls and strikes. I don't want someone who's already made up their mind. Uh, but I gotta tell you that judges are asked all the time to recuse themselves for that very reason. And I think the best judges do it. Even if they say, hey, I can be fair here, but if there's an appearance of impropriety, recuse myself. There's enough other judges. There's no need to have any conflicts. But you, you talked about at the beginning, uh, to, to say that one group shouldn't participate in the democracy and shouldn't support candidates, what kind of country would that be? I heard our governor say, I, I actually went to the state of the state um, address. address that you mentioned, yeah. and, and I heard something remarkable. He said, I don't think trial lawyers should be allowed to um, support judges in, 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 in any way. What shocked me was, it, I thought he'd at least say lawyers shouldn't be able to, but just lawyers who represent the herd guy? So apparently the lawyers who represent Pfizer and General Motors and all these people, they should participate as they do and support whatever candidates they want to, but someone who represents the paralyzed person, he should not be allowed to participate in his democracy. I think you'd need to erase the United States Constitution to have that be the law. Let me ask this, speaking of, are there reforms? You've been a lawyer for how long? Ugh, 1979. So you've been around a long time, you know the ins and outs of the system. If you could uh, make reforms, are there any reforms that you think we ought to consider as a society within the judicial system for whatever reasons? You know, I think we can always do better um, I, I think that, um, I think the system itself is terrific. I really do. I think that the system is, is set Is it better up, than most people think? Oh, you bet. It's, it, what do they say about the American judicial system? It's the worst judicial system in the world except every other judicial system in the world. I'm glad I live in a place that if I'm charged as a murderer or if, God forbid, my family should be a victim of a crime, that I live in a place where these decisions get made by real people. I don't want to have some star chamber or some appointed group that's bigger than me and bigger than everybody else deciding these things. I like a level playing field. I like the fact that if a little guy gets run over by a steamroller, he gets the same opportunity to tell his story as the steamroller company. Uh, I just think that's, that, it's, it, it appeals to everything about fairness. When I was a kid in sports, when, whether you've done anything, either in academic competition or athletic competition, just give me an even feel. Just tell me that I've got as much a shot to tell my story as the big guy. I think that's fair. I think it's American. As, as we, uh, when we were talking off camera, I mean, I was speaking to the little guy that, that there are instances where um, some someone charges a small amount of money 
and we kind of alluded this to a, a case earlier, but uh, maybe they're, they're dinging, and we've, we've seen this, where all of a sudden it'll come out that someone's charging something on your phone bill, and it might be 20 cents a month, but when it's applied to millions of cases, no individual's going to go to uh, take someone to, to court uh, over 20 cents a month, uh, and so who's going to enforce the law? And I, I had also mentioned, just for the viewer's sake, that some years ago we did a uh, panel discussion on whether the class action lawsuit, maybe we ought to define what that means, but w whether class action lawsuits were a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the lawyers that stuck with me said that uh, the fact of the matter is there's not enough regulators in government to make sure that everyone's coloring within the lines and following the letter of the law and any number of times just almost like kids acting up when the teachers out of the classroom if they think someone's not looking they'll start engaging in behavior they shouldn't behave in so then the question is who holds them accountable now, he was making the case that the trial bar does because people think the retribution the threat of a suit for doing the wrong thing the cost of that would be so prohibitively potentially expensive that they go ahead and continue to engage in the behavior they should be engaged in. That, that would be the argument for the I, trial board. Yeah, I think, it, I think it drives everybody crazy when they, you get a phone bill or any kind of consolidated bill that someone's stealing a little bit from you every month or every week. And it's not so much that you're gonna make a big deal out of it, you just go, I'll just pay the thing. It's, you know, they've clipped me for 25 cents here or maybe $30 here, or they put some charge on, I don't even know what it is. Well, who's going to go to court and fight over that to stop it? And you're right. Where are we going to find enough governmental employees? And do, I think we got enough government in our hair. Do we want that many governmental employees? But if I'm that phone company or that computer company or that person who just, you know, puts me in a record club or puts some charges on my Amazon bill and I don't know what it is, if somebody's out there and paying attention to that and gathers together all the people who got gypped, and says, well, now it matters. Now we're fighting about something. Well, the reality is the companies, the legitimate, honest companies, aren't going to do it because the amount of money that they clipped people for, they're going to have to pay them back plus. So you want these eyes on people. You want the ability to bring an action. Even though each individual only lost 50 or or $100, do we really want to just be clipped by every single uh, commercial group in the world and always get overcharged? People don't want that. That that, even though it's small potatoes in in, in the in the beginning, it adds up. And, and most people are working paycheck to paycheck. They can't afford to be chipped all the time. Uh, before we close out, let me just ask. It seems like every industry is being changed by the advances in technology. Hopefully, mostly for the better. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we have new technology, then we also have new areas where there might be abuses of power. We talked about the. This whole Edward Snowden thing and looking into our lives of privacy. Uh, we're going to be having all of a sudden drones flying outside of windows and maybe peeping inside. To what extent does the trial bar, when you get together, let's say in a conference, do you consider the ramifications, and, and I don't know if you do, mm -hmm. but do you look at the ramifications of some new breakthrough technology and say, is this a threat to society at large in some form or fashion? How do, and, and if so, how does that progress to where then lawyers engage in suits? Well, I, technology, of course, are tools. And technology, good technology is a good thing. And reckless technology is always bad. We're in the midst of litigations right now under the way that microchips are manufactured. And one of the things they did is flood the rooms when they're making the microchips with a, a chemical, a gas, uh, and that ethylene glycol gas gets and basically makes it sort of uh, dust-free, germ-free, in a very a sterile, sterile environment. environment. Yeah. Unfortunately, the people who worked in those rooms now have children with their organs born outside of their bodies. They have this horrible sloughing disease. It's just, if I showed you the pictures, you, you, you wouldn't want to go on with your day. So um, the technology in itself, when it's good, it's great. But to simply to elevate the advances of technology over the people who've got to work with the technology and then end up injured, that's a mistake. And it's a mistake that I think everybody shares. Independent, Democrats, Republicans, nobody wants to see people hurt. 
it's like when people ask me if they want to hire me as a lawyer. You don't want me as a lawyer. If, if, if I'm your lawyer, something really bad has happened to you. Um, so it's better to get out in front of it and not have it happen in the first place and not have litigation. So I guess the, the point to that is something, as you, the example you alluded to, that uh, something happens and all of a sudden uh, stories will start filtering out one way or another, either through the media reports or perhaps uh, someone Just comes... Just go to the room. hospital and you'll find w w the damages that occur when somebody's now got cancer because someone was not thinking or they've got uh, terrible injuries or they're paralyzed or they're burnt up. You don't really, people always think that there's this litigious class of people who want to be a plaintiff in a lawsuit. Trust me, nobody wants to be a plaintiff. Nobody wants this misery. This is, that's just insane to blame the poor guy who got paralyzed. That's, that's wrong. Last question. I don't know if you've had any uh, discussions with uh, Governor Rauner or if you know him before he became uh, governor. You know, I, I don't know Governor Rauner. I know a lot of people who know him. A lot of my friends know him very well. My niece and, and his daughter are, are classmates in, in business school. Uh, so I, I look forward to meeting him. Uh, and, and I was going to say, to what extent would you, who is the president of the trial bar right now, is, uh, and you will be until June, early part of June, would you try to reach out to the governor and say, hey, listen, here's our side of the deal. Let's not butt heads. Maybe there's compromises and things that could be worked out. I am the kind of person that the last thing I would do, do is presume to tell the governor of the state of Illinois that he needs to talk to me. But I would be happy to sit down with he or his people uh, and discuss these things. I'm sure he's a very busy guy these days. Uh, but I hope that, I, I do hope that, and I wish him well and, and the best with, with his, uh, his governorship, but I do hope that he doesn't lose sight of the fact that most people, most people need access to civil justice and most people are living paycheck to paycheck and this is, this is not like a cookie cutter business where you take the state of Illinois and you cut out all the things that are unimportant, you ship all the jobs to China. The real people here, real great people in this state and I, I, I think, he, I hope he knows that. Uh, I hope he protects their rights. All right, well John Cooney, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Thanks Terry, glad Thank to be here.